We're back with the Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. We'll, we'll just continue with the conversation, just as we had promised, uh, the issue of security in different parts of the country. I mean, it's like just after the election, there seem to have been pockets of attacks and the fact that a lot of Nigerians have lost their lives in the course of this. Now, just a few days after the Kaduna state government announced an immediate imposition of 24-hour curfew on a Sambo Giri area of Chinko local government area in Kaduna state, bandits also have abducted 10 secondary school students in Kaduna. Now, the State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Samuel Aouna, confirmed the incident in a statement that students of government secondary school, Aon, day secondary school to be precise, were kidnapped. That was on Monday. Now, while in Adamawa, the State Commissioner of Police, CP Afolabi, Baba Tola has confirmed a reported attack on Daban community in Hong Kong local government area. Now in Taraba, at least 15 civilians were killed in this latest attack by bandits in the state. The spokesperson for Taraba uh, State Police Command, Usman Abdullahi, confirmed the attack. Now going to Kogi, suspected headsmen invaded a local community of Kogi state. That's the not central part of Nigeria. The attack is coming days after there was an invasion in a certain community it's called Edede community, where 10 people were reportedly killed and several houses burnt. The incident was confirmed by the Kogi State Security Advisor, Jerry Omar Dari. Now, more than 30 civilians have also been uh, killed. There are reports to the fact that 30 civilians have been killed and the United Nations had also condemned this particular act by terrorists suspected to be members of the Islamic State of West Africa in Borono. That's in March 2023. But just to understand why this is happening, you know, after a very long time when we feel like we have gotten uh, control, we felt like we were in charge and then all of a sudden we're having these attacks, uh, we have Austin Edgar, who is a security expert. He joins us this morning from Ibadan by phone. Austin, it's good to have you join us. Good morning. Mm. Austin, I'd like you to share your thoughts on, you know, the recent one. Ten students have been kidnapped. Uh, it's been confirmed by the police uh, public relations spokesperson in Kaduna State. How does this make you feel when we have been grappling with that from a very long time? And the issue of, uh, you know, uh, the cheaper girls, we can't forget about that. Well, uh, first of all, we have to look at... Uh the foundational ideology of terrorism. Whichever name we the take, or whatever form they take, bandits, headsmen, we still know they are all formations of terror. There are factions or branches of the big three that we already know, which is ISWAP as the name goes right now. And um, we, we see that if we can truly place the foundation at which terrorism is set up, it is the society places the world in quote success and they expect every citizen to act in a certain manner to be successful by the laws and the norms that are laid down in the society. But when some certain people cannot obtain that success by what the government have laid down, they fall out from the society and form a group or a government inside another government. This is the general principle of terrorism. Now, from the election time, there was expectation that probably they will get a candidate of their choice. From all the states that you have mentioned, there were interests of who they expect to be their leader or their governor. Within this period, there were also a heightened security alert from all the states. We saw surveillance operation of all the military and the intelligence community working to ensure the safety of everybody in this community. But now there is a lack in security. As you can see, all the law enforcement and the military enforcement have returned to their various units and their formation. And they see this gap uh, for them to unleash uh, this terror attack again. And now, they don't want to feel defeated uh, following 
the current rating of terrorism in Nigeria from a position of six to eight. They don't want to feel defeated, and they still want to establish their presence by creating so much panic in the country. Generally, that's what we are seeing from all these states. All right, so Edgar, you have a school of thought, and if you look at it in its real sense, you probably might want to align with it. It's that with the narrow redesign policy, it felt like, you know, this element, the bandits, the terrorists, and those, uh, Boko Haram, what have you, were really out of business for a time, but um, they all of a sudden have been up, and then it's a time where we have, you know, uh, the narrow in circulation, not entirely, but there seem to be some so sort of improvement from what we have experienced. And some people think that uh, there might just be a connection with, uh, you know, the sponsor, sponsors of this act who resisted, you know, this particular policy, went to court, and of course uh, their, their intentions or their desires have been met. Do you agree with the school of thought saying that uh, there might just be a connection with those who protested against this policy and the fact that we have uh, the narrow in circulation now and the uprising of these attacks? Well, truly, you, you, you can never uh, uh, exclude uh, the banking system uh, from any kind of uh, organizational oppression, especially in the seamless oppression. Every organization, be it formal or informal, be it legal or illegal, require funding. And this, some of this funding, especially from the criminal underworld, uh, they depend on their black market to do their funding. So for the time being, before the elections, we saw that uh, the policy from the Catholic possibly from PBN actually crashed some of the black markets, as we can see. The black markets could not function Getting of arms was not possible for them. And of course, funding their operations in any way, it was not possible. So it is actually, in my own thing, I feel that the cashless policy in Nigeria has been delayed for too long. Though it came in a very good force for us that was not comfortable for the society. But it's something that's supposed to be a part of us more than 10 years backward to have been implemented. OK, but. Uh... I mean, just looking at it now, and I'd, I'd like you to also uh, share your thoughts on this one. Security votes. Now, we also understand that, you know, the uh, financial intelligence units in the country might just be uh, having some sort of clash with governors. But again, the issue of security votes is very important. Now, with all of the states that you have security incidents happening, we have uh, security votes, you know, running to billions that are located to this state governors or states, you know, however it is that you look at it. Why do we still have, you know, insecurity? Why do we still have these element dominating and, you know, uh, having so much power and influence despite the security vote, despite the fact that these governors are in charge of their state? It might not necessarily be uh, constitutional that they control the security architecture in terms of the police, but there's also funding to that effect. So how then do we still have insecurity taking the, the front seat? It's all about governance. You see, some of these governors, they are still very far. They are taking security for granted. The primary duty of every leader or every governor is to provide security for the people. Because without security, there is no how there will be prosperity in that state. Take a look from Lagos State. They had issues in the earlier time until they decided uh, to formulate a police trust fund or security trust fund that we have in Lagos. And from that time, that trust fund have been able to fund many operations, uh, security operations in Lagos, providing vehicles and so many other things that Lagos State have been able to achieve. We have the highest population unless we still have criminality, but not like what we see in some states in Nigeria. So actually, most of these states, they have not even considered, like some state government have not even considered this, that they need to have a trust fund 
and entrusted into qualified hands that will help them handle the business of security in their states. I think they should be held accountable. The citizens should be held accountable. Whichever way it is, the citizens should hold their leaders accountable because they are not doing enough. Check from all these states that you can hear all this happening. I want to believe that they are not doing enough. They are only depending on the government security. They are depending on security from the police. The police have their own duties, but they can increase the security from this state by also doing their own efforts. Security is everyone's business. And so they have to fund the business of security in addition to the government security that is provided for them. So, so I mean, usually the, there's a statement that says that if insur uh, insurgency lasts more than 24 hours, the government has a hand in it. All this going on. Do you think that, you know, the government of different states has a hand in the insecurity that uh, the various states are faced with? It's well, really shocking. I, I, I'm excited it, to it, my own opinion, and I will not accept that. Okay. Because we see that Police, uh, terrorism, terrorism or any sort of violence, especially what is happening this time, uh, it has its roots from the political system. Now, political system is not about the governor or the ruling governor already. It's for everyone that has interest on who emerges as his leader. So there are people who did not succeed in the election. Of course, they are aggrieved. And some in their mindset, they believe they should make this state ungovernable, meaning that if everything goes wrong, the blame will fall on the ruling government or the ruling, uh, the ruling state governor. So that is why I will not truly accept 100%. It is very, very acceptable or to some extent that they could have a hand. But I do not believe in that statement in totality. No, so, so you don't believe that if uh, in, insurgency lasts more than 24 hours that the government has a hand in it? Well, I, I, I still believe that. I do not believe that. So how, so, so how then do you also explain the fact that uh, shortly after the elections, I mean, you look at the policy of the redesign NARA node, the scarcity of the NARA, then all of a sudden the NARA is in circulation. Then you have these at attacks, you know, uh, head on. Well, the, the attack was not being influenced by the government. From the no, 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 I'm, saying, I'm, I'm asking, how do you then explain? You're a security expert. I mean, I'm not saying that you're responsible for these attacks. I'm only saying that if you look at all of these conjunctions that have been put out over time, including a former military president or head of state, that if in, insurgency continues 24 hours after, the government of the day is responsible for it. And then I'm asking that over before the elections, when you had this policy, we seem to have experienced some level of calm, peace, tranquility, whatever adjective you want to use to describe it. But then shortly after we have the NARA in circulation, then again we have uh, an insurgency. This is after you also have a group of governors who have also woken up uh, you know, to protest and to say, oh, we actually went to court before this became you know, a yes. So uh, again, I ask you, what could be the reason behind that? And then you don't think that the government of the day has a hand in all of this? Well, I, I, cannot, I cannot pinpoint to the government of the day. Like I, like I said earlier, um, this, this, this terrorism, terrorism, the foundation of terrorism is based on political motive. That means you cannot truly rule it out from the government of the day. And at the same time, I cannot say that the government of the day that is really influencing the terrorism. Because take, for instance, the elections that happened, various candidates from different political parties contested, and some did not get what they wanted. And you don't know how they feel about it, and they have a way of expressing it. So it could be that it's from other factions that are not happy with the result of the election are fermenting this trouble by any means to, to credit their own displeasure about the election in the state. That is one of it. Now, on the cash crunch, it is true that we had a very peaceful uh, environment during that period. But after the elections, everything escalated. Violence escalated. Like I say, just like every other business, we all needed, as even as individual, we needed money to fund our daily lives. These people from the terror on the wall, they also need money 
to fund their businesses, to fund their operations. And so now they see uh, some little hope uh, that there have been some lack in the government by releasing some cash. Of course, they will have this cash to continue in their, their terror attacks. That is what we are having. But, um, so, so, so quickly now, let, let's also, also look at, you know, other parts of this. Uh, there's also a statement from, there's a statement that's been put out. Uh, this, it talks about the fact that we need to be electronically ready. Uh, so electronic combat readiness is up to fight against, uh, is up to, it's very important to win the fight against insecurity, external aggression, and other threats to national peace. This is according to Dambata Umar. So I, I, I like to share your thoughts now. Do you think that why we're not winning, why we, we don't seem to have a control uh, entirely, I wouldn't say, you know, 100, why we seem not to be in charge of the situation is because we're not electronically ready in terms of combat, that we haven't been able to apply technology to combat insecurity in the nation. Yes, I 100% I agree that we are very, very far from the tech world. Because we all believe in these traditional means of security, and that is why we are getting it wrong all these years. You cannot win the current war on terror by depending on the traditional means. The technology part plays a strong and a key role in trying to, to destroy the capability of terrorism, terrorism in all of these nations that are advanced. They also have this threat. In fact, Israel and U.S. have the highest attack on terror against their nation. But how are they surviving till now? Because they have enhanced every capability of technology and human manpower to ensure that they protect their state. Now, taking from the state, uh, the situation we just observed from some state governors, they don't even see a need for them to even provide the traditional physical security for their people not to talk of investing in technology. So it is actually, from every angle, we are not, we are not ready. Because these organizations, they get the best hands, they get the best brains, they get the, big, the best funding. They are very calculative, and they are very decisive with their decisions. If they want to attack, they will attack. If they want to fulfill their mission, they will fulfill it. But how could a nation or a state government withstand this attack? They have to be very decisive. They must have a mission at heart to ensure that from every angle, convergence in security is taken as a priority. Security convergence is that aspect that enables the techie and the traditional way of handling security to the highest level of success. But from now, we are very far. External aggression. I just cannot assess and just make my own opinion. But if we cannot handle these internal ones, and I wonder if it's coming from outside. No, so, but uh, I mean, I'd like to also ask you if you agree that, you know, the challenge that we're faced with is the fact that we haven't been technologically driven in terms of combat against ins uh, insurgency or insecurity. Uh, or we're also looking at the issue of the fact that uh, some persons in the security force have been compromised. There's a lot of compromise that has gone on. Lack of professionalism has also contributed, you know, to the fact that we have failed in winning this war against insurgency. Well, that cannot be that cannot be ruled out. In every profession, that cannot be ruled out, or that is actually the case. So, I mean, I, I want to understand if we have all of the technology in the world and then you have a lot of people who are compromising the entire process. How then do you even win this war when you have molds in the system? Well, now, when you have a lot of people who are not motivated, people who are not paid the allowances, people who are not properly paid, and then you expect that they give their 100, not an excuse for bad behavior, but I'm saying that do we blame it on the fact that we're not technologically driven, that's why we have not won the war, or we also have, you know, in the system, people who are sabotaging the entire process. Over time, there's been several reports from outside of the country where sponsors of terror have been mentioned from outside. For instance, you know, you have um, Dubai, 
I mean, you have countries of the world who have mentioned, pinpoint and say, you have certain persons who are responsible for sponsoring terror. And then again, we, we seem to say it's because we're not uh, technologically fit. We don't have all, all the details. So I'm, I'm saying that is that really what we're dealing with or the fact that we're dealing with internal issues, that people are corrupt, that the system has been compromised, that you have a lot of people who are representing a certain interest, and that the fact that we haven't been able to prosecute and follow them to the latter? Yes. Um, uh, so some like, what, what we are, like, Edgar, can you hear me? We probably might just have a disconnect with uh, Austin Edgar, but uh, we're, we're pretty concerned, and we have been talking about the issue of insecurity in Nigeria. Uh, not that this is the first time we're looking at the issues where students have been kidnapped. Uh, we're talking about several killings and attacks, and we have the law that's very explicit on the issue of murder. It is, you know, murder is murder. You don't even need a different explanation to all of this. But is it that we're overwhelmed? We have the security architecture in the different parts of, you know, the country. We also have the fact that, you know, governors of the state are chief security officers of their state. There will also be argument that, oh, hey, and that's just a nomenclature. But how also do you explain the fact that security votes are allocated to them? We should be a security concern. But over time... Uh, the problem might just be a lot of excuses to, oh, we, we don't control the police. We don't control all of that. But then you receive allocation every other time. How come this is happening? How come we're also having this attack shortly after the election, before the election, with the policy of, uh, uh, of the CBN, uh, redesigned, narrow note, and what have you, cashless policy? We seem to probably have experienced some sort of peace. So what exactly would have gone wrong? that uh, we're experiencing what we're experiencing. And then some quarters are saying that, oh, technology is 100. And then we, if we have it in terms of technology, then again, we will probably have control over the entire security architecture. So I ask you, Austin, uh, God, thank you so much once again for joining us. Do you think that our challenge the, in, in terms of fighting insurgency and insecurity in Nigeria is that we are not 100 with uh, technology? Oh, oh, thank you for that question. Integrated security approach will give us the solution we are looking for. For instance, we have people, technology, and processes. These are the three things you can use to handle technology. Now, from the point that you came from, yes, from the people aspect, they could be compromised because they are the one handling the system itself. And then technology plays its own role, trying to increase uh, in terms of intelligence gathering and also leveraging another aspect that the physical aspect cannot achieve. And then we also have processes involved, processes that should never be flouted. So it is these three things that must be considered all the time in order we can get, in order uh, for us to get a good security architecture. So from the human aspect, some have been compromised. They are not doing it well, because like you said, from countries like Dubai, they are pinpointing. We want to know the result from that aspect. We are not getting results. So we are only looking from the technology aspect that this area of technology, are we also prepared? Because there are a lot of transactions. For instance, there are some issues going after election, this phone conversation with this conversation, I bet that's the only technology that we can afford for Nigeria. But for the ones that really affect terrorism, they are not looking at it. They are looking at the one between politics. But we should deal with those ones that have to do with terror that is causing in insecurity in Nigeria. If they can monitor us as what they are doing, in, doing to politicians, I'm sure that is fine for us. That is applying tech uh, to dealing with insecurity. Well, we have to, you know, let it go at this point in time. Thank you so much, Austin Edgar, for being part of the show. We appreciate your thoughts and time. My pleasure. We take a quick break. When we return, we'll look at the issue of cashless policy.
And the fact that uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria, the Apex Bank, is asking that traders and those who are on the other side of the divide should embrace, you know, different uh, payment channel, just embrace uh, the policies, the apps, or the apps and what have you, uh, to ensure that we're part of the economy. We'll talk about that when we return. Please stay with us.